Behold! The green and gold! Behold! The green and gold! Alright, hallelujah! Hallelujah. I'm Kalita Fairfax. I'm on faculty in the Ethelin R. Strong School of Social Work. I'm also an Honors College Senior Faculty Fellow. And I welcome you to this very important lecture entitled The Rise of Alt-Right Ideology and its Relationship to Antisemitism, Racism, and Hate. I'm going to turn the mic over to Dean Cassandra Newby Alexander for her opening remarks and welcome. Thank you so much and welcome on a very sort of coolish rainy day uh, first day back from your Thanksgiving break I hope you all had a wonderful break and now as we approach our final week of classes with this most important discussion it is my hope that you will learn about the power of language the power of language can either inspire you to do good or inspire you to do evil. Language is powerful in that it can control our thoughts. It can control our ideas. It can inspire us to do heroic things or it can inspire us to do hateful things. And we have seen over the many years in American history that language, words, can do great and terrible things. And I hope that today's discussion will inspire you to uncover your own power and you will use that power to further what Norfolk State University stands for. You all know that our mission is to change the world. And while we say that we see the future in you, the future that we see in you is that you are to be transformative figures so that you can take your knowledge and your power and do great things, not only on behalf of Norfolk State University, but on behalf of the mission that we have for this country. So I welcome all of you, I welcome our panelists, and I look forward to an inspired discussion. Thank you, Dean Luby Alexander, thank you. I need you to please silence your cell phones. I know you all are so important, but I need you to silence your cell phones. And if you must leave prior to the ending of the panel, please do so inconspicuously. Need you to do that for me. We have a really wonderful panel, and please hold your applause until I have finished introducing the entire panel uh, to you this morning. We have Kiana Miles. Kiana is a senior psychology major from Oxon Hill, Maryland. She's interested in focusing her future work on trauma. She's a resident assistant for the Spartan Suites, and for that, we anoint her. She is also a student ambassador and a member of the NSU section of the National Council of Negro Women. Next, we have Ivy Price. Ivy is a junior English major hailing from Sheltonham, Maryland. She is a member of the Robert C. Nussbaum Honors College and frequents the weekly Honors Cafe discussions for insight into numerous issues occurring at home in the US and around the world. She aspires to become a fiction novelist and a poet. Thank you, Ivy. We have Dr. Scott Deb. Dr. Deb is an associate professor of psychology with a background in counseling, quality of life research, conflict analysis, and cyber psychology. Related to discussion in particular, he recently completed a fellowship at Brandeis University's Schusterman Institute for Israel Studies and he's also been involved in examining the cross-cultural influences of personal and cultural narratives. I do want to mention that this discussion today was Dr. Deb's idea, his brainchild. So we thank him for that. 
and Dr. Richmond, who I'm about to introduce. Dr. Stephanie Richmond is an associate professor of history at NSU. You can catch her campus activities during Black History Month and Women's History Month, as well as mentoring students during our yearly undergraduate research symposium and in our learning and living communities. She studies women's participation in the anti-slavery movement and has published work on racism, anti-slavery, and social class. And last but not least, the eldest scholar here. <laughs> a graduate of Fisk University, Norfolk State University, and the American University Washington College of Law, where she earned her JD and her Master in Law. Dr. Carol Pretlow is a tenured professor of political science, representing the university at international conferences and academic engagements in approximately 25 countries in Africa, Asia, and Europe, the Middle East and South America, Professor Pretlow's experiences contributed to research engagements under the auspices of the Norfolk State University Office of Sponsored Programs for the United States Government's Defense Intelligence Agency. More recently, Professor Pretlow has represented the university at the University of Virginia's National Security Institute in Charlottesville, and she is a monthly contributor to a WHRO broadcast show hosted by Barbara Hamley. Might we please give our panelists a round of applause. <clears throat> As we frame our discussion today, let's talk about this whole term called alt-right or alternative right, which really is a racist movement and it consists of American white supremacists, white nationalists, white separatists, anti-Semites, neo-Nazis, neo-fascists, neo-confederalists, Holocaust deniers, and hate groups. The alternative right movement is not new, as they really are ideological children of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan emerged as a violent political and ideological institution to stunt economic and political advancement of people of African descent after enslavement, 1865, particularly in the South. People who support this ideology, this movement, believe in this myth that America is an all-white nation, should be an all-white controlled nation, a white male dominated patriarchal nation. Our panel of experts are here today to address the political, economic, and ideological movement now known as the alt. Right. And so we're going to start with Dr. Scott Deb, who's going to unpack this topic for us. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fairfax. Just a quick word about identity before we get started with our questions. Uh, in 2003, thank you. <laughs> in 2003, the Human Genome Sequencing Project was completed. And what do we know from that? Is that we're 99.9% .9 identical. August 12, 2017, protesters and counter-protesters in Charlottesville, Virginia, who were there at least, uh, the demonstrators were there at least in part for a planned removal of the Confederate statue of General Robert E. Lee. What happened was a 32-year-old woman, Heather Heyer, who was a paralegal, she was a counter-protester, she was killed when a car drove through a crowd, killed her and injured several other people. To note, the trial of the driver starts today, just a couple hours up the road. So 99.9% .9 the same, but the groups felt that their unique identities were being threatened in some way, so they protested and counter-protested. Identity relates to our basic values that dictate the choices we make, and these choices reflect who we are and what we perceive to be important. It's also influenced by the society that we're a part of, the world around us, the groups that we belong to, including the groups that others make us a part of as well. So Homo sapiens are a social species, and it's no wonder that 315,000 years later, we have groups, us and them. There's several examples of this, such as male and female, old and young, Democrat, Republican, and while these groupings often help us enhance our self-image, we're more likely to be reinforced by those groups that share like-minded views as we do. So 
when we need to defend ourselves based on our identity being threatened, what happens sometimes is we react in ways that are unpredictable, often destructive, and essentially harmful to everyone as a whole. They tear our society apart. Consider South Carolina, the church shooting that killed nine people, recently the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh that left 11 people dead. So we're 99.9% .9 the same, but there's so much room to hate each other. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Why? And more importantly, what each of us can do to be responsible for it. Excellent. I think it's important to note that even with the passage of the Matthew Shepard, James Byrd Jr. hate crimes bill in 2009, which President Obama signed, we see a spike in hate crimes occurring throughout this country. I'm going to turn the mic over now to Dr. Richman, uh, uh, who will talk about some of the new studies with regards to the documentation of, uh, of the rise of hate crimes within the last few years and why there is such an increase. Thank you, Dr. Fairfax. So I don't know how many of you read the news regularly, but um, right before Thanksgiving, um, several studies were released documenting the rise in hate crimes in the United States over the past several years, really beginning during Obama's administration and then um, a, um, some speculation about the numbers of hate crimes in 2017 and 2018 because the final numbers have not been released for the, this year and last year yet. But each of these studies documented a spike in the number of hate crimes occurring across the United States. And they begin to think about why this might be happening. And to go back to the Dean's opening remarks, uh, much of the conclusion is about the role of language in our society and the increased um, hyper-political and hyper-polarization of our uh, political environment over the last couple of years. So I want to give these studies a little bit of broader perspective as a historian because we're seeing a spike, but then our question is why? And is this spike something new? Um, and my answer is, of the second question is no. Uh, hate crimes in the United States have a long history and they actually go back to well before the founding of the country or even before the arrival of the first people of European descent in North America. Europeans had to justify to themselves why they were uh, why they should take the land from Native Americans, why they should enslave people of African descent, and they continue to create this um, philosophy and idea about um, Western European world global supremacy um, and this idea of civ the civilizing nature of Christianity uh, in particular. And so they used religion, politics, and racial ideas to begin to justify Western expansion into the Americas and beyond. Uh, and so these ideas really begin circulating long before the United States was ever considered as an independent country or long before any of us would have really been considered part of the Western world um, in any way. And so as we look at the rise in hate crimes, what we're really seeing, I think, is, the, is a cycle, right? Hate crimes, numbers of hate crimes rise and fall in the United States over um, long periods of time. Uh, in re as people react to the political ideology going on around them, react to social change. Uh, and so we shouldn't be surprised, um, but if we want to move forward, right, we don't want to repeat the past, we want to learn from it. We have to think about how can we understand the current um, rise in hate crimes and the crisis around that, and how can we use lessons from the past um, to help us understand what's happening and to kind of hopefully stop this um, acceleration of hate crimes in its tracks. And so I want to touch very briefly on a couple of historical points, and we'll probably come back to them, that um, hate crimes um, rose in the United States in early American history in the 1830s and 40s when we saw the beginnings of the rise of large numbers of new immigrants coming into the United States um, from places that were not considered kind of part of Western Christendom. So when we have a rise in Irish immigrants um, coming over, Irish immigrants are Catholic, and then a rise in German immigrants um, in the late 1840s and 1850s. A group of people known as nativists began to target those immigrant groups and attack them on their religious, uh, ethnic, and language identities and, and single them out uh, for 
persecution, for discriminatory laws, right? And they build much of this on the history of racism against Afri people of African descent in the Americas and try and tie many of these new immigrant groups to non-white ethnic groups in the US and to use the same tactics that were used to perpetuate slavery and uh, racism against African Americans um, against new immigrant groups. And that extends when we see the rise of Jewish immigrants in the late 19th century and then again in the interwar period um, and, and World War II, the same th kind of language begins to happen where religion, ethnicity, race, skin color, slavery, um, segregation and prejudice all kind of wrap around each other and um, white nationalist groups um, use the same tactics to target um, different ethnic groups in the United States, and they also try and divide those ethnic groups against one another, uh, because the idea that di uh, disempowered people working together is very dangerous. All right, so I'm gonna pass our mic back. All right, so as we're building upon this discussion about identity, who's a citizen, who isn't a citizen, I'd like for Dr. Deb to uh, talk a little bit about this whole notion of of how people view themselves psychologically and then how people view themselves psychologically against other people who are not of their own community. So psychologically, I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is this us versus them and categorization that people engage in as a, as a psychological principle, a mental shortcut, if you will. There's nothing really wrong with categorizing things, putting things into different groups. There's nothing wrong with that inherently. The problem is when it becomes discriminatory, when prejudice gets introduced. And so I think that's a major component of, uh, of what you're seeing, of what's going on right now. It's not so much just simply different groups of people. It's this idea that we're so different and there's no way to meet in the middle. And what happens, again, is we have this destructive force because when you feel as if your identity is being threatened, who you are at your core is being threatened, you react defensively. If you get pushed into a corner, you're gonna feel like you have to defend yourself. One of the problems is there's no one pushing anyone into any corner. But that's the perception, psychologically. That's how people are perceiving their culture and their identity as if it's going away, it's gone. So removal of a statue represents the removal of someone's a component of who they are. But that's just, your, just a perception. There's no substance to that. But if you perceive it, and your mind is telling you this, how can you be convinced otherwise? There are ways to do this psychologically. There's a lot of ways that you can uh, conceptualize what's going on and work towards um, alleviating some of those faulty beliefs. But it takes a lot of hard work, and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, it takes discussions like this. It takes a lot of people being very open to having their views and their beliefs and their values challenged. And sometimes with new information, you can change your opinion and it's nothing wrong with that. So Kiana, you want to study trauma. So talk about how you would uh, study and, and trauma from the perspective of hate crimes, especially with those who may have been victimized very intimately by hate crimes, and what do you believe would be the most effective way uh, to then uh, work with a community who've been affected by hate crimes? Um, I would say that first you have to identify that, identify what a hate crime is and determine how you move on from there. I also think that discussions like this will help, but I don't, sorry. I, I just think that it's difficult to, to say that it's a problem with systemic racism. That's the problem. And to try to help someone, you have to fix that problem before you can address it on a, community basis. So we have to take down what was the laws that were in place, the, the Jim Crow laws, the free black slave laws that was in the 1800s. So I think if we take down that problem, that would then help the community. Ivy, as an English major, how can one use literature 
to empower, uh, to address these kinds of issues of, of raw hate, guttural hate? I believe one of the most important things is to, um, to portray people who are different from you in a way that is not so othering to the point where it's negative. Because one of the major things that people look for is representation. Media is uh, just an integral factor in all of our lives. And recreational entertain entertainment media is something that all of us partake in. So when we have, um, when we have um, entertainment media misrepresenting or underrepresenting or overrepresenting people, a certain group of people in a particular light, then we have these um, both negative connotations and a lack of understanding, which is why I believe that through language and through literature, um, whether it's uh, fiction novels, like I Want to Write, or um, television media, movies, things of that nature, um, portraying people, portraying different groups of people in a way that presents a completely rounded understanding of them is the first step into um, becoming a more tolerable society. So being able to express that through language is something that's the first step into making things better. I saved Dr. Prello for last because she's going to hold this mic for at least an hour. So I, wanna, so I wanted to get everybody else in first. But I want to hear from her, uh, her interpretation of the First Amendment, free speech. Because many of us grew up at a time when even if you talked about somebody's mama, you were going to get a beat down. But so, so what happens then when someone calls you uh, one of these bastardized terms that we know exist, someone then defaces your property, someone then decides that they have every reason to treat you a certain way, to discriminate against you, to withhold resources, opportunity, privilege, because of exactly who you are. And I, I want to hear from the elder political scientist here. Stop calling me elder. Because you are. <laughs> See, a word. <laughs> but you know, this is an interesting discussion because it places us front row center into what happens to us. And when I was invited to come to be a part of this, I thought about words and their meanings. And long before I went to law school and got formalized. The thing of it is, as I read cases and reviewed cases, it came all the way circle. The first experience I had was I was about 10 years old, and I was walking in Smithfield. I don't know if any of you know where Smithfield is. I'm a country girl. And a gentleman, and I use the term lightly, Back of me said, you little, and he used the N-word, get off the street. So I just kept walking, and he kept saying it again and again. And finally, I turned around and said, he said, didn't you hear me say get off the street? I turned around and said, oh, I thought you were talking to your mother. <laughs> uh, at which point, my uncle, who had a barber shop, grabbed my arm and said, Carol, come in here. Now, you can't talk like that. I said, but I didn't say anything. I said, your mother. I didn't say your mama. I said, your mother. Anyway, when my dad got home from work, he filled me in on the dangerousness of that situation. OK, live and learn. A few years later, well, let's say 30 years later, I'm walking across Granby Street, and I hear some young men saying something, and they kept saying, dyke, 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 dyke. Well, guess what? They, weren't Af they were African American. And I turned around, and I said, you know, um, thank you for calling me back, asshole, asshole, asshole. <laughs> 
Now, what have we accomplished? Ironically, I sat on the street with them and talked about the meaning of words, the context, the effect, and what they mean legally. Okay, then about two weeks ago, I'm at California Pizza going in, and I heard uh, some young men, about 20, I guess, and they said um, they used the N-word. Uh, and they kept saying it, but I wasn't sure they were talking to me. And they said, nigga this, nigga that. And I turned around and I said, I know you're not talking to me because that is not my name. And they said, lady, we weren't talking to you at all. We were saying it to each other. Now, I thought that was strange because they were not African-American or of African-American heritage or of African heritage. And I proceeded to question them. I said, why do you feel you can use that word with each other? They said, we have friends that use it. And they say, nigga this, nigga that. I said, but are they of African-American descent? The point is that words have meaning in context and based on experiences and opportunities to use those words. Now, I have to admit, in the situations that I just talked to you about, I was hurt. But I have a way of not showing my hurt to other people. Just as I have a student, I don't see her here now, who called me the B word. And I turned around and I said, oh my God, thank you so much. I've always wanted to be one. You know, they're all smart. And, but that was not how I felt. Because a lot of times our feelings go explode. But through the law and through family experiences, I have learned to kind of use humor. Now, that does not mean that in all situations that humor suffices, because last night as I was looking at cases based on what the Supreme Court has said and the interpretation of hate speech, it's vastly situational, it's vastly a part of how people interpret events, and the court overall seems to feel that it's a violation of First Amendment rights to be restrictive. Oh, that means the law is in a dangerous place. All right. So I'd like to open up our discussion with our audience. And if you have a question for the panel, a comment, if there's a topic you'd like for us to explore, please come down. And, and offer it into the microphone so we may all hear it. And I do own this mic until the end of this panel, so I expect all of us to be on the NSU code of conduct here today. So any, any takers in the audience? All right, so while you're thinking, let's talk a little bit more about uh, this whole notion of white supremacy. Let's talk about white supremacy in the context of systemic racism, and I'd like the panel to address that. So one of the things with the systemic aspect, which is a really interesting point, so we exist on multiple levels, right? Who we are, our identities, it's all wrapped up on different levels. On an individual level, you can say on a micro level, it's the unique qualities and pieces that make you unique, an individual, you, who you are. Um, then we have kind of a middle level, which is the groups that you're associated with. Um, Sometimes these groups are assigned to us without our choice, um, such as Dr. Pretlow's example, um, people talking and not knowing if they're putting you into a category without your permission. But we all do something like that. And then you have this systemic level, kind of a macro level that exists. The society that's around you, the criminal justice laws that were referred to earlier, um, the way our society runs, public education, the way um, government is run, the different branches of government. All this exists on a very, on a systemic level. And what's interesting is that it differs culture to culture. You go to different places, they have different ways of living. There's not a right way and a wrong way. There's just different ways. And so that's one of the big things to keep in mind. It's not always us versus them, as I was alluding to earlier. It's sometimes just 
different ways of accomplishing the same end goal, and the same end goal is really just survival, right? We, that's what people do. We all we wrap it up in different ways, but in the end, all we're trying to do is really survive. Um, so that's a really good point about systemic, because it's the overarching, uh, overarching umbrella that ties us all together. Uh, and again, that umbrella differs society to, to society, but it's a really important component that if you change it at the top down, eventually things will be different at the bottom. So Dr. Deb, what you said earlier about the, um, the, the flawed perception of being threatened or pushed into a corner, I believe that's where the system springs from, um, of one particular group feeling as though they, um, as well as um, Dr. Richmond, you're uh, rationalizing why they should be on top and that they have to be on top and keeping that um, system in place so when, even when they are presented with um, an argument for having an equal system, it still feels like a threat. And so instead, so it, it, it's dragging, it's pulling the person, the people on top down, even if it's to the same level, they still feel that as a threat. And so that's why the system is kept in place to keep that power structure going. Follow up point. So that's a really, really important point. The idea is when we make changes in society, we intend to bring everyone to the same level. But people with privilege feel like they're being brought down at the same time. That's not the case. We're trying to make people at the same level by bringing them all up to a certain standard. But again, if you're at the top and you've never existed or never known in a world where you're not at the top, that's scary. And when you're scared, you react really, really in unpredictable ways. I, I have a question. So why is it that people who are at the bottom uh, identify with those at the very top and they look at those who are ethnically and racially different as, as preventing them from getting to the top? Why is that? So in a historical perspective, this idea that the bottom, the, the kind of, the people struggling in our society identify with those who have it all, um, is some of that I think is aspirational, right? They want to have it all. Uh, and then when we're talking about white Americans who are working class or impoverished and are struggling, sometimes I think the only thing they think they have is their race, you know? The, and, and they also, much of this rhetoric is about um, what they consider to be entitlements, right? Things like welfare, food stamps. Um, so I grew up in a really rural, all white area, um, which is, surprises many of my students that I wound up teaching African American history at a HBCU. Uh, but I grew up next door to people who had nothing, right? Who didn't have running water and electricity in their homes, um, whose, you know, their family literally survived on what their parents could hunt deer in the winter and grow in their garden, like nothing, nothing. Um, so poverty um, is a lot more widespread in this country than I think many of us uh, realize um, outside of urban areas. And then they, many families either refused to ask for government assistance or were actively hateful against those who did. Uh, and so I think we get a lot of, um, resentment around um, systems that are designed to help bring everybody up to at least a comfortable standard of living uh, from people who could take advantage of them but don't want to because they're too proud. Uh, but also there's a lot of blaming going on um, in the lives of people who are really struggling quite often and they blame everybody who is different from them without being able to see that many of those people who are different are in the same situations, facing the same struggles, and there's, I think, a lot of, you know, is very, in many ways, childish, right? That if you're unhappy, you're going to make somebody else unhappy or you're going to blame someone else for your unhappiness, even if there isn't really anyone at fault, you or anybody else, right? That there's a bigger problem uh, that's impacting more than just your immediate family or your community. And so I think a lot of that willingness to blame people helps to 
explain um, a little bit of where this is coming is people are lashing out at somebody who looks different from them because it's easy, right? Rather than attacking a system that is broken and failing lots of people. Um, so, Frankly, I believe that um, the perpetuators of that system or those who are on top of it do capitalize on that. Um, it's because if you have all of the poor people fighting against each other, then they don't have the time or energy or understanding to fight against the people who are holding them down. So that's just my opinion. I also think it's kind of cultural as well, because growing up, you if you're poor, you're told you can't do this, or they are the reason why you're this way or you're that way. I think that has a lot to do with it as well. One other uh, point about uh, this kind of us versus them is that it exists, it's rampant. It doesn't exist only in certain areas. Uh, you're from a rural area, I'm from Brooklyn, where it's supposed to be a melting pot of the world. Ignorance is everywhere. It doesn't hide. So something was pointed out by the panel that I'd like to uh, address. There is a myth that there are more poor black and brown people in this country. And that uh, isn't true. There are more uh, poor, impoverished uh, white Americans. But Dr. Richmond makes a point that uh, poor black and brown folk are politicized. And so uh, because we occupy a smaller percentage of the U.S. population, uh, but though more of us are poor, then there's this myth that, that black folk are more poor and that they are all pulling from uh, TANF, from public uh, welfare. The other myth that I want to lay to rest is that immigrants can come here and pull public assistance. That is categorically untrue. You have to be a U.S. citizen or have some level of citizenship in order to receive uh, public welfare. So uh, I think it's important that we address myths because part of this hate situation that we find ourselves in is the perpetuation of myths and it's really significant for us to discuss. And the other piece is we are in the state of Virginia and Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy during the, the Civil War. And so Virginia has a very strange relationship and we have the senior historian here, Dr. Newby Alexander, with the Confederacy, with uh, the erection of markers, uh, post-Civil War and the ideology of the lost cause. And I know we don't have time to really unpack that today, but it's important that we are educated uh, about uh, the uh, complexities of, of white supremacy. So are there any questions or comments? Come on down, and remember, I own the mic. So come on down. You want to state your name and your major, too? Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Pasha Calhoun, and I'm an English major, minor in political science. My question is to y'all is how do we change this? Like, how do we, like, start things? Like, how do we see more black people in the 1% or actually in the government as, like, political figures? Okay. Well. <laughs> Uh, there are a number of ways, and of course, as a political scientist, I think politically first stop. I think education is very, very important because education opens up opportunities and actually not just employment opportunities, but opportunities to think and interact with people a little bit differently. The second thing is that I really think that being involved and engaged in our political system, now that doesn't mean, okay, I voted, goodbye, I finished. It means on a daily basis being aware of what's happening around you. It's writing to your congressman, calling them, making sure they understand your perspective, showing up to city council meetings. You might not get a chance to talk, but there again, you might. And it's casual interactions sometimes that make a difference in how people perceive you as an individual and as a part of a collective group. So I think both are important. I think one important aspect of this is to be visible. Each of us have our own visibility that we can share. 
being vocal when something is happening that you don't agree with, that you think is wrong. You don't have to stand idly by and let it pass. You can speak up. You don't have to necessarily be confrontational and try to win an argument. But being able to show that you don't agree and that you're not going to go along with something that you don't agree, that you think is morally wrong, that's the power that each of us have. And if each of us stand up for what we believe in on that level, that's a big step towards making the change that we need. All right. <laughs> I would hope English students would say something, but apparently not. All right. And I think to add to that, I think it's important to have the hard conversations, right? It's not your individual job to educate every ignorant person out there, but if you've got the, you know, you've got the mental stamina that day, say something, right? Call it out when, you, um, like Dr. Deb said, when you see something wrong, say something about it. Engage somebody who doesn't look like you, doesn't go to your church, doesn't live in your neighborhood in a conversation. Because the more we talk to each other, right, we've, we've kind of devolved as a society into just screaming things at each other lately. And I think that stems where, that is one of the roots of a lot of the problems, the rise in, in hate crimes that we're seeing, is that people get on their soapbox, they yell, and they've stopped listening. Um, so if we can have some sort of civil dialogue about the problems in our society and, and who we are, um, we can find some common ground, hopefully. Okay, so I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with everyone. Um, the key point is to, um, I think, definitely just getting to know different people as well as um, being visible, being present, and just not um, not get f going into a sort of stagnant mind perception of your own ability and your own um, your own possibility for achievement. Um, so just having that perseverance is something that's going to take you through a lot of things, even if the system is set up against you, even if something seems unfair, you call it out, but you don't stop trying. Next question. Yes. State your name. Hi, my name is Alana Evans. I'm a political science major. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> so my question is for uh, these two right here. Um, I feel like that uh, white privilege wasn't really addressed. It was more so like you kind of skirted around it, which is really important, especially when you're using language that's basically rationalizing those that have oppressed many for centuries, where you're saying, okay, well, there are many institutions and many uh, like environments that don't approach where these people can't be put into a situation where they're not, they basically don't have to deal with it. And that's very important because that's very dangerous because it keeps people ignorant. So my first question is, how do you guys, as white people, use your privilege to an advantage, that's one. And two, you can't sit there and say, well, in this system, when you've created the system itself. So of course you're gonna you know, call a spade a spade, straight up. When you sit up there and you get too close, it's like you wanna vilify and attack the people who basically came too close to calling your bullshit. So that's a really, really great point. In terms of white privilege, well, the easy answer to that is, how do I use it to my advantage every day, right? It's, it's there. Um, that's about it. It's, it's just there, and it's part of every day of my life. Nothing really more to say about it. I know the question wasn't for me, but I also think it's kind of important to understand that every white person isn't evil. That's kind of, that's big too. There are white people out here that do understand that they do have privilege and try every day to counteract that privilege. I will say, I acknowledge that I have white privilege and my goal as a professor is to try and use my privilege to help my students get where they want to be. 
So I use my connections, right, to, to places that I've worked before, to people that I know, to try and make sure that our students get the best opportunities that are out there and available to them. So I, you know, it's, some of it is just, and also calling, you know, when somebody says something racist, I have white privilege to say, hey, that's not okay, right? You, are, you just said something that discriminates against African Americans or Jewish people or whichever, whatever discriminatory thing they said, here's why it's wrong. And then I often get challenged, well, who are you to say, right? And then you have to come back and say, well, I have a PhD studying African American history and the history of slavery. Like, I might actually know something, right? <laughs> and also, you don't, you know, we all know a racist thing when we hear it. People know racist things when they say them. They're trying to, they think they can get away with it because there's not someone who's got darker skin than them in the room. And sometimes just reminding people who are ignorant and racist and rude that that's not acceptable is the best thing you can do with white privilege. Um, to just say that, right, just because there are no people, minorities in the room doesn't mean you can say that stuff. All right, now remember, this is a no profanity zone. All right, so if we can just keep that in mind, we can make strong points, but we don't need to cuss today, not today. Next question. Not, no cussing. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Um, my name is Aurelio Lawrence. I'm studying INT. That's interdisciplinary studies. Um, I hear your point of what you said, which was that you study African American history and you major in it and you're a doctor. But you have to know how it feels if you are in the shoes walking as a person of color. You understand what I mean? So my question is, um, would the oppress, the oppressor, who's the oppressor that had oppressed people one day, um, how should I word this? No, I got it, I got it. All right, do you really think that the people that oppressed the, the, the oppressors, right? The oppressors that oppressed the oppressed, sorry, I'm wording it wrong. Do you feel that one day they will come to a level that if they become equal to you, that you have fear that they will start to oppress you in return? Do you understand what I mean by that? Because that's what I see when I'm seeing the whole situation with the Trump movement, the alt-right movement, the KKK. It's generally fair. They know that the people that they have, they have oppressed been very resilient for a lot of years, hundreds of years they've been resilient. A lot of things that they put in front of us, we, we stepped down or we stepped over it. You understand? We, we, we went through a whole lot as a people. I'm not only talking about African Americans, I'm talking about people in the Caribbean. And then you gotta also think about this too. There's levels to this. It's not only a situation where it's just black people in general, but then look at black women in general too. They go through like double slavery if you look at it, the aspects of it. So how do you fix a situation like that if that situation is just meant to be that way? I don't think in my mind that it will change. I think it's gonna get worse before it get better. Media has a lot to do with it. Media portrays black people as these aggressive people that Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm on my soapbox. I'm, but y'all, go ahead, I'm sorry. But you understand the question. Did y'all get the question? <laughs> wow, you covered a lot of territory there. I don't even know where to start. Uh, there are so many different levels of how you approach things. Now, I told you before, I approach it with humor. That doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. And it doesn't mean that I don't learn from it because then I say, well, next time, maybe I should do this, that, or the other. I also think that I give people the benefit of the doubt. And another example, light rail, a gentleman on there told me he was all right. And I said, okay, I can get up and move or I can stay here and talk. So the choice for me was, I'm going to sit here and talk to him. I invited him to come to my Intro to Jurisprudence class. And at first he said yes, but then he kind of backed out. So I think it's a step-by-step, -step individual, little bit by little bit before it gets better. And each one of us has a different way of approaching and resolving issues. 
And as long as we don't respond in ooh, <laughs> destructive anger, which could get you in jail, <laughs> I think we're on the right track. Hold on. So the question, his comment is, we've been, black people have been responding uh, to hate and white supremacy for, for, for decades and decades, and it's not gotten us anywhere. Now, a piece of that is not entirely true, because we are not still enslaved, all right? We, we have the ability to vote. We have the ability to do many things. My mother and father were born in segregation. They talk about experiences that we're blessed to have that they didn't have and the experiences that they did have that we have not had. Now, the other piece that we are looking at now is systemic racism. And so how then do we talk about resources, education, opportunity, decision-making abilities, to be able to sit at the table, to direct and control? And that's another level of the movement that we definitely need to address. We need to address police brutality. We need to address uh, unemployment and underemployment discrimination. We need to address uh, family fragility that then is a result of uh, racial policy. And so I, I think that we need to probably have another conversation about social policy, which has been used to really suppress black advancement. And we haven't really had that uh, discussion. I think we need to also talk about this whole notion of owning power and owning control. We have over 100 HBCUs, but even with the combination of 100 HBCUs or over HBCUs, we don't match the power, the economic power, of major higher ed institutions in this country. So I do think at times we tend not to address the systemic outcomes as a result of, of racism. So I, I definitely think you have a very important uh, question that we, we, we need to unpack more. Let's take another question. Good morning, my name is Eric Cole, psychology major. Um, a lot of the things I was trying to talk about was addressed with the last gentleman. So I guess my, my new question is, we talked about understanding white privilege and how to uh, acknowledge it and teach it. So my question is, with, for people of color and white people, you understand with the white privilege and, and that you have it. How do we incorporate that to others that deny their white privilege and don't acknowledge that, that they have white privilege. Examples include, that's, that's the question we're doing. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure where to start. Um, that's a, I, I, have, I don't know. I don't know, I think first it's, first and foremost, you gotta start with yourself. That's all I can really, I can't really influence anyone else past myself. If someone else is influenced by me, that's, Great, but that's their choice, to their behavior. I can't control anyone else's behavior, and I'm not trying to, but I can use myself as an example and conduct myself in a manner that I feel is morally responsible, that upholds my beliefs and my values, and not really just not force anyone else to do anything that they don't want to. I may not agree with other people. I may not be able to explain to them what it is that I'm trying to convey or what I'm trying to um, uh, sh explain to them, they may not get it. And all I can do is present the information, explain it as best I can, go through it, and be there for when that person's ready to accept that information. I can't really do much more. Sometimes the more you force an issue, the harder it forces itself back upon you. And we have to be really mindful that forcing people to acknowledge what they're not ready to acknowledge. It may not sound like the greatest thing, but you can't, you can't make someone ready to accept something that they're not ready for. You can point it out, and you can be upset by it, and you can do things to counteract it, but I don't know how you change someone's behavior unless they want to change it themselves. So we have to make everyone responsible for themselves, first and foremost. Um. I agree with your point for the sake of saying, sorry, I just had the words, <laughs> but you can't really teach someone who doesn't want to learn. You can do your absolute best, of course, 
but that, I believe that's a major problem when you get into debates especially or um, even arguments with someone or expressing them to like check their privilege or something like that. If they don't want to accept it, then they're going to drag out a debate and they're going to basically run you around and try to, and basically waste your time because they don't want to accept it and they're not going to accept it even though you are telling them flat out. And um, like it was brought up earlier, it's not um, our job as a black person to educate uh, every white person that you come across. Coming from the perspective of someone who wants to be a novelist, I'd say um, media is a great place to start because that's something that people consume like daily. So um, whether it's social media, creative media especially, um, if you have, uh, if you call issues into consideration there in a natural way, and that takes some time to get to, um, to master or to even do effectively, if you take the time to express that issue um, in media that someone's going to consume, then it's much easier to, if they already have the idea in their head. Because that's how we got stereotypes, so my thing is why can't, even if it's a slow process, why can't we undo it the same way? Okay, next question. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Point of personal privilege, Mr. Whitaker was my advisor. So. Thank you, Dr. Fairfax. Um, thank you to the panel. My question, uh, my name is Larry Whitaker, Jr. I am a graduate student here studying school counseling. My question is, we talk about white supremacy, we talk about discrimination, we talk about all this trying to integrate. So. Um, actually, this, this could be a question for anybody. Why don't we stop trying to integrate and just start our own as black people? Do you all think that's a pro? Do you all think that's a con? Like, what are your thoughts around that? And, and well, yeah, go ahead. Ooh, that's a difficult one. I think it's, uh, I agree with you. Let's, for everything that is there, we can start our own, HBCU. But on the other hand, there are things and opportunities that are out there that we don't have uh, access to and do not have the funds or the ability to create by ourselves. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't, can't, it can't be done. For example, we get criticized a lot now for affirmative action. Well, and I have been in situations where people say, well, the only reason you're here is because of affirmative action. And actually, I heard someone say that not long ago. And I said, yeah, but I stayed because I'm, I'm sorry, I do use foul language. I stayed because I'm damn smart. Now, see if you can trump that. Because if two smart people, you don't believe in my mental abilities, but if we join forces, we can create a whole new environment. And believe it or not, one of the people that said that to me, now we go out to lunch frequently and talk about education and how to expand. So I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a, a collaborative effort. Might I add, there's an excellent book written by Jessica Nimhart that uh, debuted last year called Cooperative Economics. And she reviews the history of cooperative economics within the African American community. And so we have always started our own uh, economic networks. 
The question then becomes what happens when the financial institutions decide that they're going to trump those cooperative economics and, and bury them and eliminate them. Remember, we had Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then what occurs. So I think the reality is America is a racial society. The point is how then do we move forward living within this, this racial paradigm? I also want to point out we're talking about white supremacy that impacts more minority groups in the United States than just African Americans, right? Where do you draw the line? And uh, black separatist movements aren't new, right? We had, they go all the way back to the early 19th century. There were African American men who fought in the American Revolution who asked the um, government under the Articles of Confederation to give them space and the government of the state of Massachusetts to give them space to start their own community. Um, the problem is, right, I can look out at our audience and I'm guessing, I know some of my students are here, they, ha they have a white parent, right? Do they want to leave? They, right? We're not separate people anymore, or we really never were, right? <laughs> and so to think about separatism, then you have to say who goes and who stays, and that's a hard question for lots of people to answer. Um, and is separatism going to get anywhere? It hasn't in the past, right? It's created more slavery and oppression in Liberia and Sierra Leone. So it's something interesting to talk about, but I don't know. History tells us some scary things about it. Next question. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Artis. I'm a sophomore bio pre-professional major. And my question, well, I'm gonna start with like a little bit of a comment first and I'll lead into a question. So you, you have said that, you know, we're no longer in slavery, so there's no need to like evoke the, an aggressive response, but however, it's manifested into other things like the destruction of Black Wall Street, stop and frisk, system at like mass incarceration. So it's like, will anything get better or will it just be manifested in something else? Because we tried silent protesting, we tried, you know, LA riots, Baltimore riots, and nothing seems to be, Con like a concrete answer. Everything seems to be manifested into something else. So will it ever be uh, evil, not evil, even playing field or will it forever be, slavery forever be transformed into something else that'll, like a system in place to keep a certain group of people under wraps? Let me, let me address that because that, that, that question is to me. I made the statement that uh, we are, we, we, black folk are not in physical enslavement, uh, that we don't have a legal, uh, segregationist society, it's, it's segregated in other manifest forms. And so there are experiences that we have today, uh, uh, generationally, that older generations uh, did not have and fought for us to have. So if you study history, there are historical differences with the way in which we experience the world versus earlier generations. That was not meant to uh, indicate that racism and white supremacy is not a problem. What I'm suggesting, however, is we evoke the words of Coretta Scott King, who indicated that every generation must win its freedom. It's one at every generation. What we are seeing, I am offering, is another generation of fight. We simply need to decide if we're gonna get into the fight. And so the question, in my opinion, is not whether or not racism exists, why it exists, why it continues to exist. The question then becomes, how are we going to combat it? And I'm offering to you that we need to look at systems change. Someone calling you the N-word should not be at the base level of why you want to create change. But someone not having access to wealth building opportunities, not having access to the same kind of job opportunities, the same kind of opportunities to own property, those are the kinds of discussions I think we need to, to have. So I am saying let's flip the dial a little bit and look at systemic growth and opportunity. Come on, you have another question? All right. What, look, come, brother, 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 come, I, come on, come on, here. just come on, just come on, just come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so to correct what I said earlier, right, what I meant by us not getting anywhere is because when you look at the different um, systems that are here, you got the Chinese, they got their own society. And in most places, they got little Chinatown. Then you got the Jews and you got the little Italians, they got their little Italy or whatever the case may be. Black people do not have that. And when you look at the dollar circulation that goes into the communities, they're circulated about at least 10, about 10 times, I think, 
Black people, I think, is like one or two times it circulates within our community. Every time we try to build up a community, like Rosewood, for instance, it gets torn down. Everybody keeps saying um, Oklahoma, same thing. Um, you're talking about Harlem, same thing. So the question is this, right? You really believe, do you really believe in your mind that we can stay integrated and the system works that way, or do you think segregation will probably be a better idea? Definitely, I don't believe that segregation is a better idea. For one thing, I think that we live in a world of diverse cultures, and I applaud and enjoy all of those cultures, Asian, Jewish. Uh, I don't want to be in a segregated world. I have experienced that. It wasn't that great. Um, but as slowly as things progress, I still celebrate the, the growth that we have achieved. You know, and it's, maybe it's little and it's personal, but it's still progress. You know, and I know that when, as your generation, when you see small steps, you're like, oh, that's just a little thing. But it's not, because with progressive small steps, ultimately, collectively, they become large. And I can give you some examples of those, but we don't want to take up any more time. Okay. Um, that is a very good question. Um, I do not believe that inherently a community where you have, you know, predominantly black people and black owned businesses, um, black doctors, black lawyers, I don't believe a um, a community like that is inherently bad. The issue of them being destroyed, being burnt down, I believe it, it goes back to the people who are in power who don't want that, who, who that struggle is, well, it becomes a struggle because of people who don't want to see us prosper. And with that, I believe that we have to take care of that threat before anything is actually going to um, before a, a community like that is going to have a big benefit. But by the time that happens, we're going to have, um, I think we're going to have a good number of black people in government and in, um, in higher positions in order for it to, um, in order for it to become even safe to do that completely. So I guess what I mean is to have that it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be ineffective, but in order to keep them prosperous, then we would already need to have um, a higher presence, um, a higher voice in places of power so that we have the, even have the ability to keep our communities that way. I think, um, Ivy had, makes a really strong point that if communities are separated, it becomes even more difficult for those who don't have enough to rise into the, the ranks of the, the have a lot, right? Because money is a finite resource in many people's minds. Um, so I think ideally, right, we want to see black businesses that have patrons of all uh, backgrounds, white, black, Asian, right? The idea is the the business is great and it's owned by an African-American person, which is wonderful, and we're all going to patronize businesses that sell the products we need and support the community vision that we want to see, um, and hopefully that's a diverse one. Dr. Franklin. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, during this program, I was really thinking about just the Jewish population and the amount of oppression that they've dealt with historically. Um, thinking back to the Holocaust, there's estimations of almost six million Jewish individuals losing their lives. Even before the Holocaust, just much persecution, dealing with a lot of persecution all throughout Europe, Persian empires, Roman empires. And Jewish individuals, I think, are very unique in that it's an ethnic religious group and that there are individuals that may be Jewish and they may be atheists. 
There are individuals that could be Caribbean Jews, Jamaican Jews. I mean, it can really go on and on. And given what's just transpired not too long ago with this Pittsburgh shooting, um, I've kind of had the question of, you know, what are some of these factors that are linked to anti-Semitic movements? How is the Jewish community responding to that? Kind of question two, hitting you with a lot. Uh, question three is, given that there's a lot of oppressed groups here in the States, how can these oppressed groups work together to accomplish similar goals? I'll start with, well, uh, I'll start with the last one because that's the one I remember best, the question. Um, I think the first key is to understand that a lot of the differences that people feel, a lot of the marginalization that people experience, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter what group you're from. So if you feel, if you're, if you're from a minority group that's being persecuted in whatever way, shape, or form, I think you just have to acknowledge that other people are going through the same thing and realizing that, like we were saying earlier, there's strength in numbers with that. People coming together, despite what they're going through, but coming together based on what's important to them, right? Just think of base, people's basic needs, survival needs, social needs. Going to, coming together, forming together, as opposed to segregating ourselves, I think is much more um, an important strategy just, just to on one hand, acknowledge what everyone is going through. Right? We all have a narrative. There's a whole bunch of different cultural narratives that just persist, and they go through communities, and they exist, and sometimes they change over time, and that's the slow progress, the slow change over time. You have, you have historical events such as the Holocaust. You have, more recently, let's think of 9-11. Right? This idea of cultural trauma, it shapes how a whole generation of people view life, view the world, how systemic, we talked about, a lot about systemic things. This idea of where do these systems come from? Some of them have been in place for generations and generations. Some of them are relatively recent. I mean, we all take our shoes off at the airport in the United States. That didn't happen 30, 40 years ago, right? I mean, this is all the Patriot Act. This all comes out of this whole counterterrorism approach. So if we look past the ethnic and racial differences, especially I, this idea of man-made differences, right? Race is just a man-made concept. Um, the label, the categorization is not real, right? A lot of the things, so go with me for a second here, a lot of the things we've been talking about today are not real, they're imagined. We put these things together in our mind and then we act upon them. Right, this is psychology, right? We're, we're, we have this cognitive ability to make things up and then go behave and go do things based on what we imagine. It's great that we're so complex and organized and we can think abstractly about things, but in the end, it all comes down to these basic needs that we all share. Um, and so when you have these narratives that exist, these threads through different cultures, it's really... Sometimes we're so caught up in our own narrative that we fail to see other people's narratives. Um, sometimes just being humble about it and realizing that you're not the only one going through, some, going through something. You're not the only, uh, I, I'm, I'm Jewish. My background, I mean, I had my grandparents and great-grandparents escape the Holocaust. That's why I'm here. Um, if I can understand and be humble about that and realize that other people are going through similar issues of just their whole personhood being stripped from them, that I'm not the only one. I mean, as horrible as any one of these collective incidents are, these historical traumas are, in the end, they all impact individuals, right? And you can humble yourself a little bit in saying that I'm not the only one that that happened to. And we can come together on that more than anything else. I think that's, again, I think we get so caught up in this cultural narrative that is our own, that we fail to remember that everyone has their cultural narrative, and there's no right or wrong with that. Everyone just has their own cultural narrative, and every new generation has their, their own cultural narrative as well. So old cultural narratives get rewritten, get expanded. Sometimes they come, they get told through stories, they get told through, um, you know, grandparents telling their kids what things like. 
My kids weren't born when 9-11 happened. My daughter read in her textbook about 9-11, one page. That was the most traumatic event in my life. I, I went to, I was in school a block from World Trade Center. To, to them, it's a, a page in a book. To me, it's this life-changing moment where everything just took a 90-degree turn. So every generation has their own narrative. My kids don't understand this narrative that, I've, that I believe in, that's important to me, that's impacted me. I can't discount the way they, they see the world or how they're going to see the world. All I can do is explain to them what I'm going through. And they may, they'll never have lived in my shoes, but the experience that I'm describing to them, the emotional pain of it, the you take away, you strip away the incident and you come up with just the raw things that are human about whatever's going on. That I can share with my kids. That I can share with whoever I'm talking with. People can share that with me. And that's where we find ourselves on common ground. Um, I also think it's important not to compare the struggles because you often hear the argument which was worse, the Holocaust or slavery. Um, I think that's important. I also think it's important to read literature about it. I know my professor, Dr. T, she gave us an um, article on how the Jewish community and the black community are coming together again because it once they came together during the um, civil rights mu movement. And to there was tension there, but now it's starting to become more together now. So I think that's important to come together as both the black community and the Jewish community to fight the fight. I agree wholeheartedly because it should never come to a contest about who suffered more because people suffered. At the end of the day, people still suffered. And um, it's important to remember that a lot of injustices and experiences do intersect. That um, you have minority racial communities and uh, religions, ethnic religions, um, sexual orientations, different incidents throughout history all intersect and people are not always just one thing. Like, I'm black but I'm also a Christian so there is something that, the, a, part, a group that I'm part of has still done damage to the world. And so it's, it's not, it's just not right to try and put one type of oppression or one type of trauma over another person's trauma because everyone has had trauma and those traumas um, are not completely individual. Maybe I'll address Dr. Franklin's middle question about what are we seeing different groups doing together. Um, and so I think uh, particularly in the wake of the synagogue shooting, we've seen some really beautiful coming together of different religious organizations and different faiths and different communities to support the survivors. And I think this idea of not, you know, everybody struggles, right? Everybody has had terrible things happen to their people, themselves, right? And so not ranking them and just listening and acknowledging somebody else's pain is an important part of healing. Um, and not, you know, not trying to say, hey, you had it worse or I had it worse, but we all, you know, terrible things happen to everyone. And to recognize that, I think, is an important part of healing from some of the damage that's been done to our society by hate groups um, and to fight back in a very personal, individual way. And that's w one more quick point. When we talk about hate groups and how, the, how this gets infused into the conversation, we've been, the last couple of things we've been talking about have been about segregation and differences, and this is where these hate groups come right in. They swoop in and play off of that. And on some level, we're all complacent, complicit in that. Right? We have differences, sure. We want to figure out ways of um, making our world better, absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. But we're in danger of creating new in-groups and out-groups because of this. And when we do that, we leave that door open for the same thing to happen again. 
the same differences. Maybe the next wave of racism or anti-Semitism, it won't be religion-based or won't be ethnicity-based. It'll be something else. But we're leaving, we have to recognize when we're leaving that door open for it to happen. We have uh, time for one more question, and then we will close. Your name and your name. Hi, I'm Michaela, political science major, uh, plan on going to law school for constitutional law. Pratt is one of my teachers. Um, so I have a question about uh, kind of the system, so I know that um, I believe in sometimes we can't always blame the victim, but we have to blame the system that the victim was, you know, produced from. So with that and hate groups, all right groups, white nationalists, how do we um, how do we truly correct a system that is so embedded? So like with the judicial system, we see a lot of like people who are in the NRA, who a lot of KKK and white nationalists, they tie into a lot of politicians. So you give money to these politicians, and these politicians then make legislations based off of the money you give them. You know, from an economic standpoint, a lot of these nationalists have uh, big companies, they're CEOs, you know, we have KKK members that are doctors, lawyers, um, even with mass incarceration, you know, the more people we put in jail, the more money they get. And so essentially, you know, it's like minorities, not just African Americans, but they're being put in the position for the system to fail them purposely. I mean, America was based on this racist system. So how do we fix a system like that? How do we fix a system that's been in place for 400 years? What a tough question. Okay. <laughs> and you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> that means we got to be more politically active, engaged, and not just on we look at midterm elections and say, oh, the congressman this. How about city council? How about school board? How about all the various committees in this city alone that we can go and participate in. Now, it's not going to be a, a short jump from a small committee on education to the House of Representatives, but it is going to be, we're going to have input, we're going to learn some things, and we're going to be able to use those things to help even further. One quick example, I learned community organizing from a lady who had maybe a sixth grade education in my hometown, and she told me, many things that were just subtly, that's not in the textbook, about how to, we went to one block and I was like, we don't need these people. She said, we need that person there because she's related to everybody on this block. If we get her, we get the block. And she went block by block, block. So that was a learning experience. We have got to get away, and I love Norfolk State, this is my family, but we've got to get away from thinking that all learning is in textbooks. It's experiences, it's engagement, it's our churches, our neighborhoods. That's how we do it. I also think that we can't fix it. I think we have to acknowledge that we're not able to fix things. We're able to change things, but it's not going to fix the whole system. I don't think anything is going to happen. Um, if, we try to, if you try to take a whole project and complete it in one step, it's not going to work. Uh, so I think we have to realize our limitations um, as a society. Um, and what I tell my clinical psych students is um, you're learning how to help people when you're doing clinical work, and that's great. You're not going to change the world. You're going to change the lives of the people you interact with, but that's not the whole world. So we can try to fix things, but it's one step at a time. Um, I would say in a perfect world, just throw it away and start over. That's what I would say. You absolutely cannot settle. You can't settle for um, less than the end goal, and I feel like you need to keep working towards that and making sure that um, it, even if you know you won't see it in your lifetime, that you plant the seeds for someone else to keep it going. Um, and just don't let it stop for, for, with just your, with just a few people at a time, just like a few people and think that the job is done. So I'm going to go back to Dr. Pretlow's engagement, right? Sure, the NRA has lots of money, 
and money is good for advertising, but politicians don't get elected unless people vote for them. And they answer to their voters. And so if you don't want your, po your politician to take NRA money, call them and tell them that. And get your friends to call them and tell them that and say, I'm in your district and if you take NRA money, I'm not voting for you in the next election. They'll listen because they want to keep their job. Right? And that's the kind of thing you can do. If you say, I care about this thing, and if you don't do something about it, I'm not voting for you. And really, I'm going to run against you. Right? And we saw that happen recently. And we've, right? We had a party change in the House because people got mad and said, I don't like what the people there are doing. I'm going to run against them. And people voted for them. So do, right? Do it. And it's at every level. If you don't like what the city's doing, you don't like what your neighborhood civic league is doing, show up, say something, and if they don't listen to you, run for office. And we can make change, but we actually all have to get out there and do our civic duty of voting and calling and writing and showing up to meetings and coming to town halls to talk. And we'll get there, right? It took 400 years to build it. It might take 400 years to change it, but it's not going to change unless we do something. Please uh, applaud this panel. <laughs> we we're brave enough to talk about this whole alt-right ideology. I think this is just part one. We should have part two next semester. And just remember that freedom is won at every generation. So you have work to do. Thank you so much.